Well, hello. Let's get into this and finish the book of Jude today. And next week we will be launching, really, we're coming up to the end of this series, but you will be given some options. We're interested in what you would like next. So um, I'll just, one of them would be to take a look at the Gospels and to do it the way I've done it many times before. And that is, it, it takes a long time, but I go through each of them and just tell Jesus stories. We call those just Jesus stories, but they're not about justice just, but just Jesus stories. And we show you what you've seen and what you haven't seen. But you may have heard those before because I've done those at several places over the years and people have recordings, I'm sure. The other option would be to go to the Old Testament and to not go through it in the order the books were written because there was rewriting, there's all of that other stuff that we've got going on. So instead, um, what we'll do is just look at them in groups and try to understand how the Old Testament came together and what we do with it or what we should do with it. Those are just some ideas. But for today, Jude 8. In the same way, we've got to back it up now. Jude is a very, very short book. It uh, Obviously, the writer of this book has been in touch with Peter. He has read the book of Enoch, perhaps several of the books of Enoch. He has a good knowledge of intertestamental period literature. Yeah, there was a lot written. I, I, when I was a boy, they called it the 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew. It was anything but silent. There was a lot of scripture writing and compiling and, and doctrine settling. There was a lot going on during that period. Well, very much, it's very obvious that Jude was very aware of all of this. And those stories are woven in this tiny book. Remember, this is about judgment, but this is about the judgment to evil and the, the blessing of the good. He just mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah and they'd given themselves over. That phrase is used a lot in scripture, giving yourself over to sexual immorality and perversion. Um, then we also um, will find it in Romans, where those that you know, see creation and therefore should know there is a God, they give themselves over to this. So they give themselves over to that. Your life is a gift to you. Who you give it to or what you give it to will determine whether the gift was wasted. You know, you don't want that to happen. And no matter what's happened in the past, it's not wasted if you turn to Christ now. And we can help you. If you ever have questions, info at rsafeharbor.com. We'll sort that. We'll help you through. Verse 8, in the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. The only way that we can find permission to sin is if we can break the foundations of morality and ethics. And there has been a movement since humankind's been here, but now it's just been amplified by the internet, 24 hour news stations, um, constant having to fill content in entertainment. Therefore, it must be new, it must be radical, it must be frightening, it must be shocking. All of this stuff is feeding a need to break loose from Jesus. Because if you break loose from Jesus, then you've got what? Well, you've got permission to do what you want to. And so these people, so they can do what they want to with their bodies, must first reject absolute truth. They must reject right and wrong. Uh, they must reject anyone who is an embodiment of that truth. God, celestial beings, Christ. And so while we see faith going down rapidly in our world, we also see self-harm and harm of others and violent pushing at each other, trying to provoke something so someone else can record it on a phone. All of that comes starting with rejecting the concept of absolute truth. Now here's where we need to be very, very careful. When I was a boy, I was taught a lot of things as absolute truth, and they would find verses that certainly made it look like absolute truth. And anybody who was liberal, they didn't use the term progressive back then, at least not in our circles. 
anybody who's liberal was said then to disbelieve the Bible. Well, progressive Christians, just like any other Christians, can make mistakes and they can find a way to talk themselves out of accepting a truth. All of us are able to do that. We are, world, we are the world champions at being able to talk ourselves out of any responsibility here and into being able to do what we want to do. But the problem is, a lot of the things I thought were true were out of context. They were verses that didn't apply to us or they were misapplied or the language wasn't understood. And when you bring that up, people will say, well, then you're progressive. Well, perhaps, but normally by that, they mean you reject authority. No, no, no. I'm trying to come under the authority of Jesus Christ, which means I might trouble some waters in your congregation or in your small group or the like. That's not my intention. In fact, I wish it would never happen, but I know it does. That said, I absolutely believe in absolute truth. The training that I went through for my first doctorate, it was in uh, psychology, the modality that was, uh, that reigned supreme among my professors was something called rational emotive therapy. It's very, very valuable, um, absolutely valuable. If you've never read about it or gotten a um, idiot's guide to or something so that you, you don't have to study hard, just see the basics. You, you will see how valuable it is, but only for people that are able to, to really think and process and the like. And so people in terrible trauma doesn't work as well. People who um, never made it past eighth grade because of intellectual um, disability of some sort, not gonna work for them. They need to go behaviorism. There are so many other modalities. But for most of you listening, it would work. The only problem is they have, they have a rule, and that is that there are no absolutes, and I would question it. And I can remember one time a uh, professor leaning over my, my desk, getting red in the face, you know, spittle flying, going, there are no absolutes. And I looked at him and I said, does that include that statement? Got very quiet and I ended up taking a little bit longer to get that degree than I really wanted. But what you think matters. What you think forms your core beliefs and your characters. And if you're not thinking rationally, you can destroy yourself and others. And that's what James and Jude rather is talking about here. They've ignored the standard. They say a meter is however long I want it to be. Two plus two is five if I want it to be. And by the way, a major professor in a major US paper just wrote a column insisting that two plus two plus equals five is completely rational and to say otherwise is some form of white supremacy or Christian nationalism or something, which is, so terribly sad because you don't want anybody building a bridge that thinks two plus two equals five. You don't want anybody designing anything that believes two plus two equals five or that a meter can be however long you want it to be, any of that. You know, you could look at the scale and the scale might say 200 pounds and you can go, well, that's your opinion. But I, I measure myself in golden butterflies. This is not a path to a happy life. It's a very dangerous one. So to get there, what they have to do is attack facts. Two plus two equals four. They have to attack whole processes. Um, there was another article about how getting up early is racist. And we're going, when you start attacking the others, they are evil, you know, all black people, all white people, all Hispanics, all Asians. You start attacking all Republicans, all Democrats. You start attacking all Catholics, all Baptists. What are you doing? You're really giving yourself permission to be free from being moored to any of this. And you can just do what you want to. And if anybody questions it, you attack. That's what's happening in our society, but it was happening in theirs too. So what does he have to say about this? They pollute their bodies, reject authority, slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand. They speak abusively 
against whatever they do not understand. And what things they do understand by instinct, like unreasoning animals, these are the very things that destroy them. Oh, there are so many examples that you know and I know. It's in the newspapers, it's in, remember newspapers? It's in the news, it's on your cable channels, and sometimes it's even turned into entertainment when it's really destructive and it's a horror. It's an absolute horror. Well, I remember we'd be in America and uh, I didn't watch religious TV. Um, we weren't really allowed to watch much TV at all, but certainly not religious TV. So I'm not sure when, when and how the first time I saw this guy out of, I think it was Cleveland, named Ernest Angsley. And he, he was a very strange little guy. But people were pouring money into him, <clears throat> filling up his church. And he would go and heal them of being uh, deaf. <clears throat> Not really, but that's what that's a show. <clears throat> Always happens midway through the first one of the day. Sorry. <clears throat> he would... Um, you rub their ears and go, baby, baby, can you hear me? You know, and then slay them in the spirit by <clears throat> hitting them on the head. And, and they would fall backwards slain in the spirit, but somebody just hit them in the head. So his, <clears throat> his ending was not a good one. They rarely are. But he would walk about and insult the devil and act like I could just say, get out of here, devil, and slap you, devil, and just, I mean, absolute disdain for the devil and even as a boy I'm going you don't do that you don't walk up to a grizzly bear and and just kind of whack him in the side saying get out of here you're not that tough really it's not going to end well Michael the archangel Michael who is the um, <clears throat> the guardian angel the um, Really, the, the mascot, I guess, not mascot, that would be, it's terrible. The guardian angel of law enforcement art, um, officials, plus also uh, some special forces. Because every time you see Michael in the, in the Bible, he's in battle form. Gabriel, good news. Michael, battle. Even Michael would not insult the devil. He just said, the Lord rebukes you. That's enough. But that should also make us not join the Twitter herd and Instagram herd and such. You're a terrible person and you're awful. You hate all blank people. Instead, let's not be bringing insults and charges and accusations. Instead, let's remember what Michael did and merely speak the words of Christ. Remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil? How did he respond? By quoting scripture. In context, <laughs> important. All right, moving on. Woe to them, they've taken the way of Cain. What did Cain do? What he wanted to do. Oh, save us from a world where people get to do whatever they want to do whenever they want to do it because it'll be murder and chaos. We need some lines. Do we need, you know, 80, 80 million laws? Probably not, but we do need some lines. They've rushed for profit into Balaam's error. Balaam thought he could get away with making a buck and not being that close to God. Doesn't work well. They've been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. <clears throat> Interesting story there. Korah was tired of Moses' leadership and he got quite a few men to back him up. And he went up. <clears throat> they all knew God had chosen Moses, but they, they just felt like that wasn't the best choice. And Korah led this rebellion and God just opened the ground, swallowed them up and closed it. When you, you say, all right, I know what God says, but I've got, I, 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 I want to serve God, but only in an advisory capacity. There's a problem. There's a real big problem. These men <clears throat> are blemishes at your love feast. That's not a reputation you want there, is it? Eating with you <clears throat> without the slightest qualm. 
shepherds who feed only themselves. The number of churches I've seen destroyed by shepherds running it their way, not being humble and open and listening, but rather assuming that they have the rights to make these decisions and <clears throat> if other people are faithful, they'll just follow. And church after church is destroyed. Empty church buildings litter the land and people that are broken by churches are everywhere on their couches, in their cars, in their office, wondering, what do I do now? It's one of the reasons <clears throat> that we are with you right now and right here. A lot of you have been hurt like that. <clears throat> Trust me, I was fine. As soon as I turn on that, turn on the phone to record, and I do apologize. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind. Autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Again, what, what are we looking at here? Clouds without rain. Well, making promises, but not fulfilling. There goes the political class. They are you know, blown along by the wind, autumn trees that look beautiful, but there's no fruit in them. You're, what you're actually seeing is evidence of death in the colorful leaves and no fruit. They're twice dead. They look pretty, but they're not going to help you when you're hungry. There are wild waves of the sea foaming up their shame. I've seen that in pulpits and you have as well. Screaming TV preachers, angry, stomping around. And what good does that do? How does that help you? And he says darkness is reserved and that darkness most likely means annihilation. But regardless, let's take a look because he's not done talking. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these things. And here's the quote. See, the Lord is coming with his thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they've done in the ungodly way and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. It's a lot of ungodlies in one big pile. How'd they, get, how'd they get to be ungodly? By rejecting authority, by rejecting that there is a truth. Now, you don't need to believe that we've found it or that we know it perfectly, but we do have to agree there is a truth for which we must seek and to which we are then to adapt because it's a reality. It's kind of like in the car, when a kid goes, are we there yet? You know, it's frustrating for the kid and for the parent, but they have to deal with the reality that there is space between here and grandma's house. And we must stay in this vehicle until that space has been traversed. Don't think you probably should use the word traverse with the small child, because that's not gonna help. Just tell them, yes, we are. You do, you're just having a dream. You're sleeping. You're dreaming that you're in a, stuck in a car. Uh, these men are, okay, good. We get, to, we get to see what they sound like. Grumblers, fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. I've seen this in religious gatherings where you have the, the great ministers come together. By the way, this really sounds like it's slandering all of them, and by no means am I. Uh, the vast majority of ministers I've met are very decent men and women who absolutely love God. Some of them, by their life, I'm pretty sure they love God more than I do. So don't tar with all the same brush here. Over here, we're talking about the subset of the certain, the angry, the fault finders. The ones who walk in, not to worship so much as to see whether or not they will be pleased and whether or not they agree. It's those of us who have been in certain religious tribes know that there are times during worship that a fight can break out. Not because somebody came to worship God, but because they came to grumble, find fault and do a power play. And no wonder the world rejects Christianity if that's the only thing they see. We need to get these nicer ones who, again, I believe make up the vast majority. We need to get them more out of the brick and mortar and onto the streets and into homes, 
into workplaces, into schools, serving and loving in the name of Jesus. And I think God's actually making that move happen in his own way. And reluctantly, a lot of people are having to go because they're losing their buildings, they're losing their, their ability to have a big paid staff or the like. And that's tragic in many ways, but it also moves us out of that in the box mentality and we go into all the world and we take the gospel with us because we live it and we love God and we love them. What a radical concept. Well, he says, but dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus foretold. They said to you in the last times, there'll be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. Please remember that the word heretic was not originally applied to non-believers. The word heretic comes from the word for division. It's someone who splits up churches, families, homes. The one who has arguments, the one who pushes their agenda, even if it pushes somebody else out the window. He says they don't have the spirit. They'll act like they do and that you should follow them, but they don't have the spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus to bring you eternal life. Please take care of yourself. Please. I know that trying to preach a full on Sabbath is most likely going to fall on deaf ears. And so I understand that. But take 15 minutes here. Take a half hour there. Take a walk around the block and just start a conversation with God about anything, about the birds, the sidewalk, about your feet hurt, whatever. Pay a little bit more attention to what you're eating, when, how much, and why. Take a little bit more attention about when the phone should be turned off, when you should just watch a TV program maybe that won't make you smarter about anything. It'll just be fun. Take some time because you are valuable and you are loved. These preachers he's talking about will come along and beat you up and he's saying, build yourselves up in your faith. God loves you. You know Jesus, and don't let the devil whisper in your ear, well, if you really knew him, you'd be acting better by now. No, you know Jesus. And yeah, you've had issues and struggles, and you have, um, you have failed many times, just like me. And I'm not done failing, and neither are you, but we will not fall away from the love of God because he's got us. So build yourself up in that. Get some confidence in that. Take care of yourself. It's okay to take care of yourself. And if you need help with that, again, email us, info at rsafeharbor.com. We'll help you in any way we can. We have gone to do weddings, gone to help with funerals, baptisms. We will find a way to help because we believe God will help us and because we believe you are worth it, all right? Be merciful to those who doubt. Do that. Be kind to them. My doubts scandalized my family, not all of them, basically my father, a brother-in-law, scandalized them. In fact, my father even told me that he wasn't able to find a, a place to preach because I had ruined our reputation. Now this was when he was in his mid seventies and it was more probably because he was in his mid seventies and his version of our tribe was very tiny and shrinking, but it was still hurtful. I will tell you, I, I'll listen to your doubts. I'm okay with them and I'll treat you with respect and gentleness all the way through, but I will ask you a favor and that is to treat me with respect and gentleness through my doubts. None of us are quite as good as we want other people to think we are. All right. 
snatch others from the fire and save them. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. It's a very strange way for us to hear this phrase. It's a Semitic way of speaking. In other words, help those who are sinning, but don't fall into sin with them. For example, Jesus ate with people who were sex workers. They were uh, publicans. They were sinners, which covers a whole lot of territory. He ate with them, but we have no, no evidence that he ever was tempted to engage in any of the sinful behavior. So he loved them enough to be with them, to help them, to fellowship them, to make sure they're, they're eating and drinking. And yet he didn't become one of them. It is shocking to me how many times in my life we've run into a, a family that is breaking up and it broke, it broke up starting with either the husband, a Christian, starting to study with a non-Christian coworker and they become attracted to each other or the wife studying with a coworker or a friend who's a guy and they become attracted to each other. And while studying the Bible, they split the family and they, they go into adultery. It is stunning. Uh, it is heartbreaking on every level. And so James here, I keep saying James, Jude here is saying, work with people, but remember there are lines. Let's respect the lines and be careful. Always be careful. Then to him who is able to keep you from falling, and see, it's not really, he's got, he's got you. And to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God of our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Wouldn't that be a great signature on the bottom of all your emails? That really would be. Be a blessing. Thank you for walking with us through Jude. And next week, we get into one of my favorite books, First John. It means a lot that you're with us on this journey. If you could um, hit a like on this, if you could subscribe, and if you could share this with a couple of other people. I have a feeling other people need to go through the Bible and find the good news there. You can help them do that. God bless you. We'll see you next week.